Good evening, and I trust we are all sit staying very safe. Welcome to another session in the UWI St. Augustine series of virtual open days. Over the past few weeks, the campus hosted information sessions that focus specifically on undergraduate and postgraduate admissions, as well as financial services. If you have missed any of these informative sessions, I invite you to view the recordings on the UWI St. Augustine's Facebook page and the YouTube channel. My name is Dr. Sanjay Bahadur Singh, and I am the Deputy Dean, Enterprise Development and Outreach for the Faculty of Engineering. And on behalf of my team and I, let me welcome you to the very best faculty here at the St. Augustine campus. I think you would agree with me when I say that we are the best faculty because your presence here today shows that you have an interest in learning more about the programs that we offer and the process for you to join us. We do look forward to having you very soon. We will do our utmost best to address all your questions because we are truly looking forward to welcoming you here at the UWI later this year. During our Q&A segment, we will answer as many questions as we can. So I do invite you to send those questions. And when you're sending your questions, ensure that they are all, they are channeled to all panelists and attendees. After today's session, you can still contact us. You may use the email engdean.office at sta.uwi.edu. That is engdean.office at sta.uwi.edu. And rest assured, we are committed to assisting you however we can. So let me give you an idea of how the program will flow for this evening session. First, you will hear from the faculty's dean, Professor Edwin Equi, and he will deliver some welcome remarks. Following that, I will let you know a little more about the programs that we offer and the career paths that you can possibly embark upon, upon studying here with us. The Faculty of Engineering has five departments and many programs of study. And this evening, our heads of departments who are joining us will definitely tell you some more. After hearing about our departments and their programs, I am sure you will have lots of questions. We will get into a Q&A answer segment. So do feel free to let those questions come true our team will be compiling them as we go along. So let's get started. So let me now invite Professor Edwin Ekwe to welcome you. Professor Edwin Ekwe, I invite you to share your screen and deliver these remarks. Hello, Deputy Dean. Yeah, first of all, I need to explain to you the, uh, how our university is uh, organized. First of all, you have a University of West Indies. It has five campuses. And uh, we also have uh, its uh, faculties. Our own faculty is uh, Faculty of Engineering. And uh, under engineering, we have uh, five departments. And uh, all those five departments, each of them has its own head of department. and. Uh, they are going to be addressing you, explaining to you what and what their programs entail. We also have uh, four deputy deans that help in running the faculty to uh, make sure that we have a, a very vibrant uh, faculty. So there are some questions I have for you this, this evening. First of all, why would you like to be a student at the Faculty of Engineering? And why do you, why have you chosen the University of uh, West Indies? Okay, first of all, what is engineering? Engineering is not nothing more than an art whereby we apply science and use it to actually solve problems that affect uh, individuals, okay? The mankind, mankind. So we have uh, civil engineering, we have chemical engineering, we have electrical, thematics, and, and mechanical. I said all the health departments are going to be addressing you today. So I have some more questions for you. Do you have a curious mind? Do you have a passion for knowledge? Do you think that you can make things bigger, faster, stronger, or better? Can you innovate? Do you have an entrepreneur's uh, mind? If you have answered yes to all the questions, then engineering will be a wise choice for you. So there are different types of engineers by the time you graduate. There are the, you, have, you can be a professional engineer, you can be a chartered engineer, you can be an engineering manager, you can be an academic, you can be a researcher. 
And there are other aspects. You can be a planner, can be a geomatics planner or a project manager. Various aspects. More questions. Okay, how? Wherever there is a will, there is a way. We at the Faculty of Engineering would like to facilitate you to achieve your study and career goals. Please apply to our faculty. Okay, we welcome you in advance to the Faculty of Engineering at this premier university in this uh, English speaking Caribbean region. All our undergraduates and most of our postgraduate programs are internationally accredited. So what is the vision of our faculty? We want our faculty to be internationally accredited at the programs and most of the programs are accredited. We want to have well equipped labs, competent researchers, responsible leaders who must take into consideration the students and other stakeholders and who must have a robust quality assurance system and a well-structured safety system. So faculty of engineering is very big. 13 blocks, okay? So you are going to be very excited to be a part of our faculty. And on the whole, we have 10 undergraduate uh, programs. As I said, the rest of the departments will be informing you, it will be mentioning the details of their programs to you. We also have many master's programs, more than 25 of them, including uh, also master of philosophy and doctor of philosophy. As, as well as uh, Master of Applied Science. We have a lot of master's courses. So what would be my general advice to you is this. First of all, try and go online and read about all, the, read about the details of all the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses. And make sure you do very well in your CAP. Some of you have CAP results already. Some of you uh, will still un undertake CAP. Please try and make sure you do very well. And we now have a provision to also admit people from CXC, okay? So it's either CAPE or CXC, but the deputy dean will say more about it. And spend some time to set your goals and plan for the coming, coming years. Think about how, what you're going to achieve in the coming years and normally set your goals very high and never underestimate your, uh, your ability, okay? While at the university, sorry, while at the Faculty of Engineering, you will uh, study and participate in other activities like sports. You must have to strike a balance between studying and socializing. And remember that success does not come without hard work. So always work hard. If you do not want to end up as a mediocre, please study very hard. Engineering programs will be challenging, but at the same time, they are rewarding. And if you think that engineering is the best profession for you, Okay, please apply and on time too. Okay, your only limit will be your imagination. And uh, thank you all and God bless you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dean Ekwe. That was a very insightful presentation. And the fact that you are all locked onto this virtual open day is a testament to your interest in furthering your education and your interest in this faculty of engineering the campus offers a range of programs as you would have as you would have heard and we are going to explore some of that today you may know the career that you're interested in but you might be unsure what program to pursue maybe you already know the program and that you're interested in and you're wondering if you have the right qualifications so hopefully we'll be able to address some of those concerns in the next steps now in my capacity as deputy dean i would like to share with you some some insights on engineering. And most of all, this will give us an appreciation of what engineering is like. And I'm hoping that you can stimulate your appetite to pursue a field in engineering. So here we go. So when we talk about engineers, we need to appreciate where the word engineer comes from. And it has some medieval Latin origins, and it means in here, which is to design or devise. And humans have been devising clever inventions for thousands of years. But let's fast forward a bit and look at some of the model, modern marvels of engineering. So many of you all would, have, would be familiar with the Palm Islands in Dubai. This is quite a, an amazing engineering feat where we have at least 320 miles of beaches across the shrinking shoreline in Dubai. 
What about this bridge? If you have ever seen this bridge, pictures of it, you recognize that it is the Milau Viaduct in France. And it is the highest tower bridge, which shows over 1,125 feet. What about this bird nest in China? We call for the Beijing Olympics. There was a lot of talk about this, this grand stadium, and it is the world's largest steel structure. Very energy efficient and environmental friendly stadium. It consists of over 26 miles of unwrapped steel. This is definitely a model, modern marvel of engineering. This dam in China, it is perhaps one of another, the thing about this is the amount of power this can generate. It's so exciting. This innovative engineering feat creates enough power for 18 nuclear power plants. That is 22,500 megawatts, which is a huge amount of power. So engineers are problem solvers. So what about engineer, engineering inventions that change the world? Now we can talk for a whole half an hour plus on this. We don't have sufficient time, but let's start somewhere. The wheel, no stranger. We all have ridden in automobiles and recognize that transportation has changed our world significantly. And then of course, added to the wheel is the internal combustion engine. Now there's a trend towards the electric vehicle and motors and drives come into play, but the ICE has played a very critical part. What about the light bulb? It's evening time and we have lights. And of course, what this slide indicates to us is that evolution of the light bulb from the incandescent lamp to an LED filament, energy saving very conscious about our energy consumption these days. And then of course the internet, the mere fact that we are having a virtual open day, the internet has played a very critical role in ensuring that that can happen, particularly during these pandemic times. So the greatest achievements of the 20th century, we have touched on a few and there's a lot more, but these are all deep rooted in engineering. In the 21st century, if we were to come forward a bit, 3D printing. We have heard enough about 3D printing and the opportunity it brings for us, whether it be to produce car parts or artificial organs. And then, of course, marry that with the opportunity to have robotic exoskeletons that can give people with mobility issues some measure of hope. Blockchain. Many of you outside there will be very familiar with the price of blockchain and Bitcoin and recognize that there's a lot of potential for cryptocurrency. The augmented reality, where we are now able to move into a different world and experience that world without traveling. And of course, we all have a mobile operating system or cell phones. That handy little device does marvels for us. And just think about the how it, how it has evolved, the variation in handsets, you now have a cell phone with a camera, you have everything at the touch of your fingertips. So engineers, we transform ideas into real world technologies through a practical and cost effective approach. This is what distinguishes an engineer from anyone else. So what about engineering at the UWI? Well, this is our mission statement. We are here to provide internationally recognized degrees in engineering and to engage in impactful research and innovation. And just to give you a little bit of history, the faculty was started since 1961 with then 28 students. To date, we have approximately 10,000 graduates and we have at least 2,000 students enrolled. So what about the contribution from this faculty to the regional and local landscapes? Well, the, I've highlighted a few here for you and we'll go through very quickly. The geo portal has been curated to bring together the reduce biodiversity data sets so that you can link your stakeholders and the sources. We have the M fisheries project where our fisher folk have the ability to leverage on a mobile device communication, whether it be emergency, have some measure of guidance and direction, e-mobility. Here at the St. Augustine campus, 
we are the thematic hub for e-mobility through the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. We have also been very active in the fight against COVID, producing face shields, N95 respirators and surgical masks, the UE vent ventilators. We have also been very active with sport engineering. Cricket has been a very strong part of our West Indian culture, and we have been able to marry some of the technology with the sport that we love so much. We have also been able to provide our students with internships. And here in this slide, we have a student whose testament has given us a little more comfort knowing that our students are able to play a very critical role in tomorrow's decision making. Why? Let's look at what the student says. Each and every one played a crucial role in molding me into a better person and engineer. I know that they are cheering me on and when I graduate in 2021, part of this accomplishment will be dedicated to them. She has enjoyed the internship, leveraging on the skill sets and the knowledge she has learned from the classroom. This is what we offer here at the faculty. And therefore, engineers can apply the principles of science and mathematics to develop those economical solutions to very technical problems. Our work is the link between the scientific discoveries and the commercial applications that meet societal and consumer needs. So here at the faculty, we have five departments and we will learn a little more about these five departments today. We have chemical engineering, civil and environmental engineering, electrical and computer engineering, geomatics engineering and land management, mechanical and manufacturing engineering. And I also want to share with you the pre-engineering or Dean highlighted to this. This is an alternative part. If you're looking for an avenue to enter into the engineering curriculum and you only have your CXEs, please know that this is something that you, shall, you should consider. And we are advertising a restructured program expected for the September 2021 intake. And I strongly recommend that you do visit the website. It's here on the screen. Have a look and do remember to apply. So that's me in a nutshell. Let me thank you for that. And now I'm going to hand you over to our heads of departments. Our heads of departments will take us through this journey. And on this journey, we will be able to learn a little more. So let me first invite <coughs> Professor Rafi Hussein, head of department of chemical engineering. Professor Hussein, you may share your screen. I look forward to hearing what you have to share with us about chemical engineering. Thank you very much, Dr. Bahadur Singh. My dear viewers, welcome to the Department of Chemical Engineering. I am Rafi Hussein, head of department. Our department was established since 1961. It is a very unique department comprising of chemical engineering group, food science and technology unit, and petroleum studies unit. Our mission is to produce competent, innovative, entrepreneurial, and civic-minded graduates, undertake relevant research, and advance the chemical, food, and petroleum sectors. Our department currently offers 16 programs and awards, BSc, MSc, MPhil, and PhD in chemical and process engineering and chemical engineering, MSc, MPhil, and PhD in food science and technology, BSc, MPhil, and PhD in Petroleum Geoscience, MSc, MPhil, and PhD in Petroleum Engineering, MSc in Reservoir Engineering and Petroleum Engineering and Management. Our programs in Chemical and Process Engineering and the Petroleum Studies Unit are accredited by UK institutions. Let me share with you some information on our various programs. The BSc Chemical and Process Engineering is intended to provide students with foundational science and mathematics, core engineering principles, design fundamentals, involved in a safe, profitable, and environmentally sound design and operation of process industries for converting raw materials into marketable products. Chemical engineers apply the principles of chemistry, physics, 
math, and even biology to solve problems that involve the production or use of chemicals, fuel, detergents, paints, pet pharmaceuticals, food and beverages, and many other products. The design processes and equipment for large-scale manufacturing, oil and gas processing, water treatment, plan and conduct production methods for ammonia, methanol, and LNG safely and with environmental consideration. Chemical engineering careers also include nanotechnology, biotechnology and stem cell research, pharmaceuticals, design and operation of plant equipment, alternative energy, and also perfume manufacturing. Food science is the study of food, including raw materials, selection, harvesting, nutritional content, food development, production, preservation, food safety, packaging, storage, preparation, food consumption, and sensory analysis. Food technology is a practical application of food sciences. Food science professionals meet a basic human need, ensuring safe, abundant, nutritious, and flavorful food supply for the world. It is a career that carries great personal reward, challenges, and variety. Petroleum geoscience is concerned with understanding the structure of the earth from surface to depth of about 20,000 feet and to explore for areas that contain oil and gas. This is achieved using data from field trips and oil and gas wells to construct geological maps and together with seismic surveys are applied with industrial software. Petroleum engineering is concerned with the application of earth and physical sciences to drill oil and gas wells, quantify the amount of oil and gas present in underground reservoirs, and then to produce oil and gas to surface safely and economically with environmental considerations. Petroleum geoscientists, petroleum and reservoir engineers work together as a team. About 90% of our BSc students graduate with honors degree at the end of three years. About 75% gain employment in the local and multinational chemical and process industry, food and beverage industry, and oil and gas industry. The remainder would seek to pursue one of our master's program and eventually a PhD degree or would qualify for a study abroad program. Over the years, we have established strong links with the industrial sector and government agencies. Our programs are supported in the form of financial, scholarships, internship, lectureship, workshops, training in industry software in, and research and prizes to graduating students. Currently, we are offering 38 scholarships to students registered in the BSc and MSc program in the Petroleum Studies Unit. We have about 10 fully equipped laboratories for teaching and research. Our research is aimed towards national and regional development and is conducted in collaboration with the chemical, food, and petroleum sectors, government agencies within the UWI and external academic institutions. In our department, health and safety is very important to us due to COVID-19. All our courses have been moved online and our labs are conducted virtually. Students have remote access to industry software and are able to conduct their design and research projects from home. We ensure all health and safety protocols are observed, such as wearing of face masks, washing of hands with soap and water regularly, designated temperature checkpoint, and a book for contact tracing, physical distancing and sanitizing of lab equipment and workspace. In our department, we have highly qualified and experienced staff who are always ready to serve and to provide to you a memorable learning experience. 
please visit our Department of Chemical Engineering website for more information on our programs, entry requirements, our research, our achievements, and for opportunities that are available to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hussein. Very insightful presentation. Moving straight along, let me invite the head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering to share his screen, Dr. Trevor Townsend. I invite Dr. Trevor Townsend to give us his presentation this afternoon. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual open day on behalf of the Department of um, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And um, I'd like to say civil engineering is the oldest of the engineering professions, and indeed, civil engineering is the, the one of the first engineering departments that has been established at UWE. My name is Trevor Townsend. I'm head of the department, and um, I'm very happy to have you with us tonight. So we're going to be going through just a, a bit of an overview of what civil engineering is all about. Um, sometimes people ask me, why do we call it civil engineering? And I like to say it because it is it engineers with the most manners, but actually it is because it, it is how engineering moved from being a military skill into civilian and its benefits for society. And I'm very happy that you have come to us tonight to hear about civil engineering. So we're going to be just giving a short video that can give you an overview. And I On, on mute your mic, please. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Anjay. So just to recap what we were talking about, um, we, have, we have material sciences, we have structures. These are all sub-disciplines. We have geotechnical. Um, we saw highways and traffic, uh, water and environmental, uh, coastal, because coastal protection and coastal dynamics are all part of what we teach and um, construction management. In particular, we have some postgraduate programs in construction management. Of course, it's not all classroom work. Um, hopefully, once this, these COVID restrictions are, are past us, we hope to be able to be, begin our field trips right now. Everything is virtual, but we do have a, 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 a rich program of practical training. So we're talking about field trips. In this particular case, they're looking at some rock um, crops or outcrops, looking at testing um, the materials in terms of this borehole so that we are 
dedicated to ensuring that students get a practical experience. Here we are looking at um, a water treatment plant, a uh, number of students on a field trip there. Apart from the field trips, we also have lab sessions. This is um, just some students in our geology lab looking at some details of some um, rock materials. Um, we also have labs that um, deal with highway construction materials. And here's our highways lab looking at asphalt and the materials that they are used to, come to build up the, the pavements, including Trinidad Lake asphalt. This is a technician in our environmental lab where we do things like water testing and testing of what water quality to ensure that water is portable and safe. There are some students getting their hands on in our structures lab. So they're gonna go through the whole process from the weighing out of the materials to the mixing of the concrete. Um, we have some fantastic machinery um, that is state of the art in terms of training young engineers. So um, we're going to even the, the development of the boxing and the framing for the, the structures. And the labs will also be able to test, as, as we see here, testing the strength of this beam. And we have a full scale machine that does testing of wall segments and beams as the only one of its kind in the English speaking Caribbean. Here's part of our geotechnical lab where we test in the bearing capacity of soils. So that a student not only gets the theoretical knowledge in the, in the classroom, but they get hands on. Here's a fluids lab where we're looking at fluid flow through various types of, of, of pipes. So that the whole idea is a student will get a holistic teaching, a holistic training. This is a very powerful lab equipment. This is our wave room where we can actually um, simulate the action of the coastal waves running up into the shore. And we, we have been doing a lot of work in that regard in terms of our coastal engineering and management. So just to, to close off, at an undergrad, we have two undergrad degree degrees, the BSc Honours in Civil Engineering and the Honours in Civil and Environmental Engineering. And these are credited to the Joint Board of Moderators in terms of the educational base for incorporated engineer and partially for the chartered engineer. For the chartered engineer, we need some additional um, further learning and that can be done, but let me just touch on our graduate employment survey. We did a survey very recently and we found that a significant number of our graduates are in fact finding employment um, and they find employment in construction, they find employment in, in the government sector, in the highways and, and in, in, in design as well. And of course we have our master's programs and our master's programs in civil engineering and, and civil and environmental engineering and construction management as are they all accredited to the JBM and they give you full academic requirements to become a chartered engineer. And then we have our masters in coastal engineering and management, um, which is a very special program that we have. And for anybody who wants to understand how to manage our coast and how to make sure that climate change does not um, override us, but that is what we're going to recommend. So I want to thank you for listening to me and look forward to having you with us at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Back to you, Sanjay. Thank you very much, Dr. Townsend. Very concrete presentation there. And we're moving speedily along. Let me invite Dr. Fazal Mudin, head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, to share his screen as we invite him to give us some insight into the Department of Electrical and Computer and what they, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and what they have to offer. Over to you, Dr. Mudin. Okay, good night everyone. Well, my presentation comes up here and welcome and thank you for being able to attend um, in these trying times. Um, how we're operating now is, is perhaps how we're going to be meeting you in your first semester, which is virtually. So um, my name is Dr. Fazil Mudin. I'm the current head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. So you want to be an electrical engineer. So what do electrical and computer engineers do? Well, this is just a small subset of what we are about. We invent new products and devices. We design and make products and devices. We do research, we program, we manage businesses, we own businesses, we are entrepreneurs, we teach students like yourselves. Basically, we work with anything that uses or produces electricity. Where do electrical and computer engineers work? Everywhere. Right, just some slides up here quickly. Um, we work in the utility generation industry. 
Um, we work in heavy industry, a, a large part of the, the, the economy of Trinidad and Tobago is heavy industry. And even um, our engineers are employed in, in all of those uh, sectors. Communications, the, the fact that we are able to meet and talk um, now is because of communication technology that is largely um, developed and was invented by um, electrical and computer engineers. Um, there are engineers in programming and robotics. Somebody asked a question on the chat in that, in gaming, machine learning. And at the bottom of the screen, you're going to see um, a picture of someone in, in entertainment. That person is, is, is someone by the name of Anil Kokaram. He's a Trinidad and Tobago um, uh, citizen. He's a, um, uh, born here, but he lives, he lives abroad. But he won an Academy Award for his development of some image processing routines and was awarded um, that, that allows uh, people to, to restore film, which is something that some of you all may not know exactly what that is, but um, he allows you to restore old movies in a way that you can actually see it um, in using modern technology and, 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 and getting rid of all of the damage that was there before. So what is electrical and computer engineering? It is applied science. Electrical engineering is concerned with the application of electrical and electromagnetic phenomena. Computer engineering is concerned with the application of hardware, software, and networks. What do you need to do? Well, you need to do very good in your science at CSEC and CAPE, especially maths and physics, or maths and um, there's a CAPE electrical and electronic technology course now. You must get high mark, uh, marks in these. You need to do very good in your English, CSEC and CAPE, because you have to be able to read, write, and speak well. You need to enjoy solving problems. Engineering is about solving problems and creating solutions to help humanity. And you also need to focus. The, the program requires you to study hard for three to four years in order to graduate. Why choose us? Well, as was mentioned before, the programs here in the Faculty of Engineering and ours is, is no exception, are internationally accredited. We are accredited by the Institution of en uh, Engineering and Technology out of the United Kingdom. And what that means is that the qualifications that you get upon graduation here will be recognized almost anywhere you go in the world. So if you want to work or if you want to continue your studies, they recognize the qualifications that you have, uh, have obtained from us and they would not ask you to redo um, many of the things that you would be doing here. And just a little plug for ourselves, uh, we won the Vice Chancellor Award for Department Excellence some, some years ago, um, quite recently, which is a university-wide award. So you're coming into one of the better departments in the Faculty of Engineering as well. And of course, it doesn't stop there. If you want to do some advanced qualifications, advanced degrees, um, you can do them um, also with, with our department. Right now, the main areas are in communications and controls and energy systems and in integrated systems. And you can do a postgraduate diploma. Um, you can do a master's of science. You can do an MPhil and you could do a PhD. So there are lots of avenues for you at the undergrad and postgraduate level. And it doesn't even have to stop there. There have been graduates from our program who, who have gone on to work in the financial industries. Um, things some of you all it was mentioned before, uh, cryptocurrency, for instance. Some of the software programs that are used in that um, are actually things that were developed out of, of work of electrical and computer engineers. And there are people who have done electrical and computer engineering and because of the technical background um, have gone on to do things like intellectual property law, specializing in, in the high-tech world, in the high-tech electrical engineering world. So all of those are just a wet your appetite. I'm sure I'm seeing a lot of questions and we'll try to answer them as soon as we finish here. But for the time being, thank you so much for attending. And I look forward to answering your questions later on. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudin. Very electrifying presentation there. And let me take the opportunity to invite our next speaker quickly, Dr. Jacqueline Bridge. Dr. Jacqueline Bridge is the head of the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering. And she will be sharing with us some insights from her department. Dr. Bridge. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Bridge and I'm the head of department. Yeah, good. I'm Dr. Bridge and I'm the head of the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering. 
Um, within the department, the, our aim is to um, do work that is related to mechanical engineering. Now you've already learned about civil engineering, you've got some information about electrical, etc. We in mechanical are interested in mechanical engineering, in industrial engineering, mechanical engineering with a minor in biosystems. I'm going to explain what each of those is all about. So in mechanical engineering, we look at things that move, that how you transform energy from one format to another and how you utilize that energy. So we look at things like thermofluids and energy engineering, right? We see what you can get in terms of the energy, what you can get from energy, how you can transform that energy. Um, we also look at designing um, systems. So we will design uh, equipment, we will look at the effective use of the equipment, etc. We manufacture things. So there's manufacturing engineering is part of the program in ba the Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. We look at vibrations and controls. Anything that you create also has, um, it moves. And as it moves, it can vibrate and affect other people pieces of equipment. So we look at vibrations. And when you make things, you have to know what material to use. Otherwise, you might be in a situation where the system could break. So mechanical engineers produce specifications for new or modified mechanical components and systems. They design the, the components. They develop them further. They manufacture them. They install them. They evaluate their performance. And they operate and maintain them. The next set of um, engineers that we train are mechanical engineers with a minor in biosystems. And those engineers are interested in how to utilize their mechanical engineering skills to um, assist in the development of uh, agriculture and agri-processing and all those things that are associated with that. So they will look at um, environments and see how best to uh, have these protected environments. Um, so they also look at how you could effectively use your natural resources. They look at food engineering and design of equipment associated with food and earth moving and um, equipment and uh, equipment for uh, agriculture as a whole, right? So that's the BSc in mechanical engineering with a minor in biosystems. Then we have the industrial engineers. So in industrial engineering, students learn about systems, they learn about project engineering, quality, um, automation, um, engineering economics and management because industrial engineers are those engineers who are looking at optimizing overall systems. And in order to do that, they monitor and adjust what we call the four M's, right? Human resources, machinery, methods, and material. So the industrial engineer can work in fields as diverse as, um, let's say, the normal thing where you're in an industry. But you also have industrial engineers working in banks, they work in hospitals, because they look at processes, overall processes, and try to optimize those processes. So um, we also have taught master's programs. So our taught master's programs include things like engineering management. As you move up in engineering, you want to be better able to optimize the use of anything that you're doing, right? Um, how, how do you make sure that your workers are uh, acting, doing their most effective work? Um, how do you make sure that your machinery is utilized appropriately? So that's the engineering management aspects. Here in within the region, we also have manufacturing engineering and management. So in manufacturing engineering, we look at ways of efficiently <clears throat> utilizing machinery, et cetera. Um, and we also look at different tools for doing that. And the tools can be um, software tools as well as physical hardware. Uh, in industry, you know that 
you use a lot of equipment and that equipment you want to make sure that it runs the best that it can um, that you're utilizing it as appropriately as possible so we also have a master's in engineering asset management and you will notice that a lot of these programs have management associated with it because the further up you go into engineering the more management becomes important all our programs are uh, accredited by the institution of mechanical engineers uh, which is a uk body as well um, so our programs are taught by experts, etc. The important thing here is to look at the testimonials. So the students, after they complete the program, are very uh, confident about their abilities. So uh, we see that you have the student and she's at, having completed the manufacturing, engineering and management program. She's confident in her ability to design. She was part of a project to design a cocoa research uh, machines associated with the cocoa research right and then we also have another student here um, we also do research and mechanical engineering and uh, mechanical with biosystems we have a strong emphasis on creation of of machines and optimization of machines so in the past we have had a number of exhibitions with, where we uh, have our students work on display. Um, the work would can go from things that are associated with like uh, prosthetic hands. We've had uh, projects that look at utilization of plastic waste, reusing it so that it can be utilized in 3D printing. Um, we've had students who've worked on the development of uh, ocean wave devices, students work on alternative energy. So mechanical engineering is a very wide field and it's very, um, it's a field that has a lot of excitement going into it, right? So uh, I'll end here, the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering all the way. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Bridges, for a very moving, good vibe presentation. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. So now we're going to move on to the Department of Geomatics, Engineering and Land Management. And let me invite the head of the department, Dr. Michael Sutherland, to share his screen with us and give us some insight into what's going on in his department. Dr. Sutherland. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, well, good evening by now. Are you seeing my screen? I certainly am. You can bring okay. it up the screen. Excellent. So let me go to full screen. All right, and you are seeing full screen? Yes, we are. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for all of you who decided to uh, register for this event and to be exposed to uh, what the Faculty of Engineering has to offer uh, prospective students. Uh, and I will be talking about the Department of uh, Geomatics, Engineering and Land Management and what we have to offer. Uh, but first, let me talk about what is uh, Geomatics, Engineering and Land Management. Now, you have heard of, of all the other uh, departments uh, tell you about their brand of, of engineering. But if you understand that society uh, operates on uh, managing space and time, because everything occurs in some space at some point in time. And without that, there is chaos in society. You can't do mechanical engineering unless you do geomatics first. They have to be legally. You can't do civil or any, uh, exploit any resource uh, or uh, treat with any threat uh, that is occurring in space. You can't protect ourselves or exploit uh, uh, any resource without uh, dealing with the management of space and time. So uh, because of that, Geomatics engineering and land management is relevant to everything, every every human activity, whether uh, it's uh, managing what is happening in the space or uh, uh, controlling behaviors in space and time. Uh, so I, I won't read uh, the uh, text in front of you because I, I know that you you are able to deal with that. But as with every other engineering, it's uh, applied science. 
uh, and technology to manage uh, spatial temporal information. And, the, and by the time I finish my presentation, you will appreciate the importance of, uh, of this brand of engineering. So on Earth, as I said before, we uh, are concerned about things that are occurring in space. We want to know how high things are, whether or not uh, a phenomenon of interest is there for, we, for us to exploit to our benefits, socioeconomically, politically, socially, culturally. Uh, we want to know whether or not we are we are threats uh, in that in those spaces. Uh, uh, we live in a, a very active tectonic uh, zone in Trinidad, uh, earthquakes, and so uh, managing uh, information about that protects us, help, uh, helps us to protect ourselves. Uh, we want to know about the threats of climate change. We want to know the threats of, for such as sea level rise, and not only on Earth. We have interest in what's going on in the universe and in our galaxy um, and in our solar system. And uh, now we're looking at Mars and uh, the rovers that you see on Mars are, are managed there because of, of geomatics, because everything occurs in space and time. We're dealing with position and positional information. We quite recently, we, uh, we had this threat very clear, very near to us, which is uh, La Soufre, um in St. Vincent. And in order to protect people and to be able to evacuate people, and, and uh, we need to map these uh, these phenomena um, and map the space so that we can make plans in order to protect people in St. Vincent. And even before uh, the volcano erupted, uh, geomatics was used to monitor changes in the shape of the volcano in order to, to ascertain whether or not it was uh, given in any indication, um, among other things. Um, that it was going to erupt. So geomatics is very important in that regard. Uh, we are doing this here online because of the COVID-19. And if you watch the news, you would have seen maps. These maps produced by the, uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago are produced by our graduates. Um, and you can see where uh, the geomatics is absolutely uh, essential to everything. Even to say this land is mine and that is yours. You, you can't do that without understanding that it is geomatics. How do we protect ourselves against that? This is geomatics. Geomatics is involved in everything. Now, geomatics is a broad statement, a broad uh, title, a broad umbrella. And there are many uh, sub-disciplines, such as uh, cadastral surveying, and engineering surveying, remote sensing, satellite positioning, photogrammetry, hydrography, geodesy, geographic information systems, urban and regional planning, land valuation, land administration, estate, and it goes on, it goes on. Anything to do with managing information about space and time, you are dealing with, uh, with uh, geomatics and land management. And so our programs are geared to train people to deal with these uh, and prepare us to, to address these, uh, these disciplines in the wider society at the end, so that society on a whole can exploit the resources for its betterment or protect itself against phenomena that are threats to society at large. So we offer uh, two undergraduate programs, BSc in, Geoinformat in, in Geomatics or BSc in Land Management with a focus on valuation, which is it's a very unique uh, uh, program because it, it involves uh, some some uh, engineering and, and, and a bit of uh, social sciences because they do management and economics and accounting and the, the mathematics for, uh, for valuation, but also the geomatics parts in terms of uh, geographic information, et cetera. Uh, at the postgraduate level, uh, we have two uh, master's programs, the MSc in geoinformatics and MSc in urban and regional planning. Uh, and uh, and when, as you go higher, uh, you can do a PhD or MPhil in geoinformatics or surveying and land information or urban and regional planning. And for if you don't, for those persons who are not looking for a full degree, we offer a diploma in land administration and a certificate in geographic and land information systems. So that generally gives you an idea of what is geomatics uh, and, and how we prepare students for a world of working with geomatics. But then after you do that, what what do you become if you get a degree? What is it that you can do? Well, the, the first logical thing is, well, uh, you could become a specialist in one or more of the disciplines that we just talked about. A cadastral surveyor, engi engineering surveyor, 
a specialist in remote sensing, etc. And you can see here, uh, Mr. Huggins is a graduate of our land management program. We encourage people not only to seek employment, but to start employment. So a number of our students not only are employed, but also have started their own companies. So Mr. Huggins is a graduate from the, uh, the land management program. You can see on the left here, Dr. Sunil Lalu, who is uh, a graduate from the geomatics program. He's also a lawyer, a uh, valuation surveyor, and a lecturer in the department. And uh, quite recently, last or last cohort, immediately uh, she found employment. Uh, this is Ms. Sarah Maharaj working with a surveying company. The last thing she was telling us about is she was dealing with alignment of work uh, in PRK. So geomatics also make it safe for planes to land, for us to travel. Uh, and so this is very important. Right. What else can you become? Now, you can finish a uh, geomatics degree and continue on that path. But a number of persons have actually used uh, their degree and, and switched into another discipline that is related, such as coastal and, uh, engineering and management in civil engineering. Or you can see uh, Ms. Jazan Sayers, who, after finishing the land management program, went on to, to do uh, an MSc in quantity surveying at Heriot Work University, graduated with the distinction, as a matter of fact, and now works for the HDC in Trinidad. Uh, some people have done it, uh, project management. So you can, uh, you can see that you can switch or link to other disciplines after finishing our degree. Uh, or degrees. Um, we also work internationally. A number of our staff members are, are consultants to international organizations, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, CARICOM, uh, internationally, uh, NASA. So you will see that some of our graduates, uh, uh, Mr. Jamal, Dr. Jamal Brown, uh, used to work in uh, Nairobi with uh, the United Nations Human Settlement Program Habitat. And Ms. Imani Fairweather Morrison is the, chair, the chair, chairman of the board of trustees of the University of, of Belize. So the, your, your future with a background in geomatics is narrow and, and straight uh, in the discipline, but also wide. Uh, it's as wide as, as your imagination and your will to work, because as I said before, geomatics is involved with everything. And I'm almost to the end. So again, there's a question because you're now looking at your path. What is it that if you do this, what do you want to become? So I just give, I, uh, I could spend a whole night telling you about our graduates and, and how important they are um, all over the world. But just, I've just chosen a few, uh, apart from those that I've shown before. Uh, Dr. Nicole uh, Del Pesha graduated from the, the surveying uh, uh, degree, which is now geomatics. Is a, is a physical oceanographer in Tallinn University of, of Technology in Estonia in Europe. Uh, Mr. Rick Ali uh, used to be the Commissioner of Valuations in Trinidad, is now a Deputy Permanent uh, Secretary of Ministry of Planning and Development in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, uh, Dr. Steve, uh, Stefan O'Brien is a postdoctoral fellow at Deakin uh, University um, School of Life and Environmental Sciences, uh, graduate of our geomatics uh, on the informatics program. Uh, Ms. Luan Batiste is an attorney at law. After graduating from the land management program, uh, used to work with uh, as land manager at Petrochin, has now been offered a position to run the land management in Turks and Caicos Islands. And finally, Mr. Evan Parry, just so you know, we're not focusing only on Trinidad. Uh, our graduates are all over the Caribbean and all over the world. Mr. Evan Parry graduated from the land management program uh, went on to do uh, a, a master's of science degree at the uh, University of South uh, Australia and is now an environmental scientist and land value in a, a land valuation survey in the uh, same case. So uh, hopefully you will see the benefit uh, of uh, taking a degree uh, with us. Uh, it's, it's very practical, uh, technological is very practical in terms of, of your future. And you shouldn't really be thinking only about Trinidad, the world is yours. And so I would like to end there uh, and tell you, I'll remind you again that geomatics and land management is dealing with everything because everything occurs at some point in space and time. And if you wish to contact us, here are uh, some, some uh, email addresses for, the, for me, which is head of department for administrative assistant. And if you want to look at our website, here's our website. Uh, you can take a look and see some of the details of how to get in and what we do, et cetera. So thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Bardu Singh uh, for this opportunity and thank you all for, for listening.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunderland. Thank you very much for that lava hot information and out of the world presentation. So we're going to move straight along. We have Dr. Ruel Ellis who will be joining us. He is the program coordinator for the MSc in project management. And let me invite Dr. Ellis to share his screen and give us some insight into the MSc in project management. Hello, good evening all. I guess you're seeing the screen now. Yes, we. No, not right. yet. Well, I'm not, not seeing yet. the screen as yet. Seriously. Okay, but I have shared it. Let me try once more. While you while you get that up, let me in, remind everyone, keep those questions coming in. I can see there's a flurry of opportunity for our guys behind the scene to consolidate the many questions. I see some being answered in the chat. A reminder that the deadline for applications is July the 31st. So you can apply online. So that's sta.uwi.edu forward slash apply. And I see that Dr. Ellis has his presentation up. So over to you, Dr. Ellis. Well, I thank you very much, Chair. Well, uh, my colleagues have done a wonderful job of um, should I say, introducing you to the field of project management, especially starting with civil engineering in terms of where did this all begin? If you go back to your scriptures and you look at the pyramids, it was a mass movement of people, of food, of lots of stuff in order to get those things done. And that's what project managers do. That's what project management is about. So tonight, what I'm going to look at is the MSc project management or the project management office at the University of the West Indies. So the project management office is in the Faculty of Engineering in the office of the Dean. And we have Mollus Tree flagship programs. At least the flagship is the MSc in project management. We also have the MPhil and we do PhDs in project management. The program itself was established in 2003. And in 2004, we expanded into Guyana. Today, we have students from St. Vincent, Grenada, I believe there's someone from Jamaica who is in the program also, who is intend to be in the program for the next semester. So we are expanding throughout the region. Um, what are some of the benefits of the program? The main thing is really to gain skills in the growing industry of project management. And that when you look around industries, almost everything is done by teams and done in projects. It does not matter what your base skill is, you'd be attached to a team and that team would need someone to be able to plan, to coordinate, to establish resources, to motivate people. And that's what the project manager is going to do. And project management itself, it enhances your career development prospects through having achieved, well, if you do our project management, you get an Recognize project management qualification and certification from the University of the West Indies. And in that we are applying practical knowledge and skills, uh, which are being transferred from your instructors, your lecturers. And if you don't believe me, I believe we can just take um, this point of view from one of our, oops, my bad. From one of our, well, she's a current student, um, just finished her first, the 12 courses. And I mean, from her own words, you know, from the inception to its end, the MSc course was worth the decision and the sacrifice as its value far outweighs its cost to me. And this was a student who actually has done the program without gate. The cadre of lecturers must have been strategically selected as they epitomize the essence of project management team, bringing with them a wealth of diversity in knowledge, experience, and style. This was surpassed only by the intellectual content of the coursework, interactive classroom and virtual sessions, quality assignments that allowed colleagues to draw from each other's strengths, support each other's development, developing skills, and the rich dialogue that made friends out of strangers. The MSc has challenged me in ways that have awakened project management competencies and strong leadership skills already winning purpose in my life and place of work. I'm eternally grateful for the experience. And this is someone who is currently in the program. She is the project analyst at NIDCO, responsible for a lot of the mega projects that are taking place in Trinidad right now. So some of the trends in project management, uh, as already indicated, there are a lot of competition among industries. And in order to keep ahead, most organizations, when they do the strategic plan, 
they would require the implementation of projects in order to execute their strategic plan. Then we have the whole gig economy where people are working more and more independently online or working from home. Like for example, there are graduates of the MSc project management program who run their own companies who are residents here in Trinidad, but manage project teams in India, in the UK, in the US, right from here in Trinidad. Others are doing their own entrepreneurship stuff. Like there's one who has been doing well since the whole COVID-19, he's into agriculture. Um, more or less bringing food together, packaging it and distributing it throughout the country. Then you have AI and robotics. This emerging trend has not impacted and will not impact project managers negatively in that because of the amount of decisions that project managements have to make, we would employ AI as part of our decision-making processes. And robotics will all be seen as an opportunity, another tool that can be used in optimizing the work that project teams do. And yes, there's complexity and everything that's been done by humans today are complex, but project managers have the ability to take that which is complex, make it simple so that teams of people can get work done as fast as possible within the constraints of cost, time and quality. So the program itself, is delivered in Trinidad and Tobago, blended online or face-to-face -face when we are back face-to-face. -face. And as I said, there are three distinct courses. The major one is the MSc Project Management, which has 12 lecture-based courses, um, can be done in two years part-time. And it has, there's a research project at the end. This program is sometimes done by students from other islands on scholarships, in a single year. They do six courses per semester and the project, and they are out of it. Then there's the MPhil in project management where you have two lecture-based courses, two seminars and your thesis, and then the PhD, three lecture-based courses, three research seminars and your thesis. This is more or less the list of the courses that are associated in project management, as you can see. Depends on what you wish to specialize in or which area of work you wish to do you can choose your electives. There are eight core courses, and then there are four electives, which you can choose to enhance your own careers. So who should apply? Any entry-level professional seeking higher education. Um, also recent undergraduates can apply directly for the project management degree, especially if you have a um, good honors degree. Um, others who can apply are career changers, people who have been in their current jobs long enough, they have been promoted and they wish to switch to something else. Once they have the relevant work experience, they can apply for project management and then persons looking to deepen and broaden their knowledge in project management. So what's required for the MSc or first degree from an approved university and sufficient work-related experience. We try to get people in with at least a year's work experience, especially in project management because the classroom is very interactive and we need or we rely on that sharing of knowledge and information from each other. For the MPhil, a first degree. And for the PhD, either the MPhil in project management or the MSc in project management. The application is similar to all other programs and the process for applying is similar to all other programs within the university. And I believe that is my three minutes. So thank you, Chair. Thank all of you for attending. And I hope to see you once you've started or got through your undergrad degrees and you wish to further your studies and you wish to be the boss, the one who really transforms the world, like those big bridges that you saw in the deans, the deputy dean's presentation, and those 20 impactful engineering feats the person who sat at the top guiding those teams were all project managers. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. Very insightful. I appreciate the fact that you have made reference to those bridges and of course, those modern marvels of engineering. Very insightful indeed. So let me thank all my colleagues for those presentations. There's an insatiable desire to share more with many of you all, but we have limited time. And of course, now that we have captured your attention even more, you can appreciate the fact that there's a lot to offer on this campus, in this faculty, and we have the opportunity 
before we move into our Q and A session, to hear from a student. He is a student presently at the Faculty of Engineering, and I want to invite Mr. Shankar Ramharak to come on line with us, share his screen, and give some insight into his experience here at the Faculty of Engineering. So, Shankar, please join us. A good evening to you, and thank you for joining us this evening. I am right, hoping that you can share with some of our viewers outside there your experience. So the floor is yours, Shankar. Okay. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, okay. So first of all, I am a year two electrical engineering student. Um, two years ago, I was in all of your exact positions. Um, I am not a model student, uh, and I know um, a lot of you might be on the fence about thinking what to do, why do engineering, there are a bunch of other stuff, people might be telling you to do different things, you might be confident in yourself. Um, personally, I was in the exact same space. I didn't know what I wanted to do fully, I knew how to do something with electrical, and something that would give me opportunities and at that point i was thinking of doing a network course and then i just go to the campus and actually ask around and see you know what they might be for me and i met lecturers and i talked to them and after talking for a while it was clear that engineering is what i really want to do um and i still thought it might be very hard to get into and i had no chance because again my grades were average um I was an exceptional. I still tried to apply and um, God willing, I got through. Um, I just worked very hard. I knew what I wanted after talking to the lecturers. I worked hard throughout my keep. Um, I made it into the electrical and computer engineering and it was completely different from what I was used to in keep. Um, it's not at all typical. Uh, it's not you know, revised cram for exam night before. It's not uh, you could slack off. It's a lot of focus and diligence in any engineering field. But the work you do in engineering, it's way different from your typical classroom from before. Um, one thing that piqued my interest as soon as I jumped into engineering is you will hear it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. You get exposed to a lot of cool technology and a lot of cool opportunities. Um, even in COVID times, there are a lot of clubs the UE has that you could join and actually develop yourself out of academia. Um, you don't have, there's a big stigma attached to engineering as well, saying that your life goes down into just three to four years of nothing else social. That's a lie. Um, one of the key factors about engineering is balance. And if you can't balance yourself, think about when you have a family, Four years after, or ten years after your degree, you're not going to be able to do much, and that's something I struggle with even till this day. Um, there are courses that I have struggled and fought with a lot just to pass, um, and there are other courses that was more suited to my skill set, things that I was a better fit for. But that didn't mean I didn't try with the other courses just because you're not good at something. Still try. It goes a long way. You a lot of opportunities that I didn't think I could have do, but I still tried. And you build a confidence like groceries. Uh, when I started UE, I got a bursary for fifteen thousand and another one now. And because of those grants, I was able to actually move myself forward, especially in these hard times we have now. I would not have been where I am right now or going in the productive direction I am going, if it was not pretty support of the university and seeking out the help of faculty. Great, thank you very much, Shankar. Very insightful. I do appreciate you joining us this evening and sharing your experience. Thank you very much. I'm sure our viewers would have Welcome. enjoyed your perspective, which is a real present perspective, and we wish you all the best in your studies. So we move on to the Q&A segment now. This is the very interactive part of the evening. And you have been listening to us. Now we want to hear from you. We have received your questions, noted your question, and we will try to address as many as possible. Joining us this evening to help us answer your questions, we also have the Assistant Registrar for Recruitment and Enrollment, Student Affairs Admissions, uh, Ms. Simone Roberts. We have the Recruitment Officer, Mr. Nigel Bradshaw. We have the Manager, Financial Advisory Services, Ms. Christy Smith. We have the Senior Assistant Registrar, Graduate Studies and Research, Ms. Deborah charles Smite. We have colleagues from the Bursary Financial Managers, Mrs. Caroline Gooding and Mr. Kevin Kalu. We also have a representative 
from the Graduate Scholarships and Funding, the Senior Admin Assistant, this is Sarah Kalu Bagwandin. So let's move straight into this and let me ask, uh, we have uh, some questions coming in here. So let me go straight to Kevin. Kevin Kalu, are you with us this afternoon? I have a question that I'd like to pose to you and then I'll pose one to Ms. Sarah Kalu. So Kevin. Hi, Dr. Bahadur Singh, I'm here. Great. So Kevin, I have a question here. Is gate funding available for engineering programs? Right. Interesting question. Good one too as well. Um, I want to tackle that from two perspectives. Um, one in terms of undergrad programs and two in terms of postgrad programs because it's slightly different for both of them. At the undergrad level, gate funding is available for applicants, prospective students. Um, the gate policies have been adjusted uh, recently as August 2020, uh, which means that GATE will only now fund one undergraduate level program. These include uh, certificate programs, um, BSc programs, etc. We, I know that the faculty has just recently launched the certificate in engineering, um, the pre-engineering, sorry, yeah, pre-engineering program, yes. uh, which students can do and then uh, seek entry into a, a BSc level program. Um, what GATE is saying is that they will fund um, either or they will fund either that certificate program and 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 uh, or the the BSc. They they will not fund both of them. So that's important for students to understand perspective and otherwise. But remember, let's take a look at the cost of these programs. Um, the typical cost of the, the uh, a BSc program is around fifty four thousand dollars. Uh, for the entire program, yeah? The certificate program is 22,500. So students need to weigh up uh, the funding uh, and decide, okay, am I gonna take gate for the certificate program or am I gonna take gate for the BSc program? So it's something to think about uh, because as I said, gate will only now fund one of those programs at that level, yeah? Um, so that's undergrad. Uh, with respect to the postgrad programs, unfortunately, uh, GATE has uh, stopped their funding for postgrad programs, but that should not deter uh, prospective students at that level. Um, the fees for a postgrad post program is quite affordable, um, and I encourage students and prospective students to visit the website and look at that fee booklet. I, I guarantee when they do that, they would see the level of fees and, and realize that a postgrad program is within their means and quite affordable, right? Even though the gate funding is not there anymore, all right? And I'm sure uh, my colleagues here in financial advisory, in, um, in DSSD, they, they, they would have spoken about or will answer questions on, um, you know, bursaries and, and that kind of thing. So we have ways in which we can help you to finance your degree, especially at the postgrad level and definitely at the undergrad level. Thank you very much, Kevin. Very insightful. And as you mentioned, scholarships and bursaries, this will be a nice opportunity to engage our colleagues on that. I know that we have uh, Ms. Christy Smith, who's here. And Christy, are you with us? Would you be able to lend some information to this and share with us what sort of scholarships and bursaries are available for the postgrad students at this time? Hi, Sanjay. Good afternoon. And to all our viewers and prospective candidates, I want to say a special good afternoon to you all. I hope you're hearing me clearly. Yes, we are. Yes, because I have some great information to share uh, with respect to scholarships and bursaries. And Sanjay, I will speak directly to the opportunities for scholarships and bursaries to, uh, for undergraduate students. My colleague, Sarah Lewis is all, also on the call and she will specifically deal with the post-grad group, okay? Sure. So I'm always happy to, to say that at the University of the West Indies, um, we are fortunate enough to uh, receive private donor funding from members of corporate Trinidad, the campus community, individuals, alumni, or regional and international partners, and generally those persons who just have a vested interest in the development of our students here at UE. And so um, based on that, we have just about 350 scholarships and bursaries on offer um, to both incoming and continuing students. 
And these scholarships and bursaries are non-tuition based. What that means is that students can use the funds to do what they need to do. And we hope, of course, that they use it um, to, to further their degree in different ways, whether it is to purchase technology, um, to ensure that they have the requisite material, books, um, and equipment, depending on the degree that they're doing. But certainly, um, it is not uh, a, a, an award that they must use to pay their tuition fees with. And I also say that in the context of GATE, because I know when students are completing their GATE form, they usually ask whether or not they receive a scholarship and bursary or bursary. So they're a bit hesitant sometimes to apply because they think that our scholarships would have to go down on the GATE form. I'm happy to say that because our scholarships and bursaries are non-tuition based, they do not need to put that in their GATE form, application form. All right. So to get into the meat of the matter, um, for the Faculty of Engineering, we actually have um, just about 30 uh, scholarship opportunities available. Um, and some of them range from the Association of Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, Board of Engineering. Um, we have uh, National Energy Corporation. We have the National Energy Skills Center. Our Republic Bank also offers scholarships through us um, for engineering students, National Gas Company, PowerGen, Trinity Power, Trinity Plan, and the list goes on. And for, so those are very specific scholarships for engineering students. And uh, we really want to invite students, the continuing ones who may be on the call with us, but certainly the new students who are coming in in September, we want to invite you to apply for these scholarships and bursaries, whether you're doing civil, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, geomatics, um, and a range of, of opportunities provided through UE degrees. We just want you to really take the opportunity to apply. Your application date runs from the 1st to the 30th of September. That's the 1st to the 30th of September. What that means is, of course, you would have been in, um, in UE by that time registered. And so you now you now have the opportunity to go online on our website. And I'm sure we'll put it in the, in the chat. Um, sta.uwi.edu backslash scholarships. And you should get all the information there. Uh, it's an online application form together with three main supporting documents an income and expenditure form, which allows us to assess your level of need because most of our scholarships have that financial need component. So you can access our scholarship based on your level of need together with a GPA requirement, of course, because we are an academic institution. However, some of our donors are amenable to going down to at least a 2.5 GPA sometimes, um, depending on the financial needs situation. And uh, in addition to that, we looked at the holistic students. So we want to also ensure that students participate in some level of extra and co-curricular activity. Uh, we also have scholarships specifically for student athletes. And I know our student athletes come from all the faculties. So you're more than welcome to apply for those particular scholarships. So again, you're applying online, sta.uwi.edu backslash scholarships. Your application period is the 1st to the 30th of September. A minimum bursary is $5,000. It's non-tuition based. And of course, um, if you need any further support, our department has live support sessions every Thursday from 1 to 3 p.m. And you can check out our web page, Financial Advisory Services, for more details on that. And you'll also receive an email with such. But you can check it out and call, log on with us. You know, come and let us share information on how you can apply. Sandra, thank you so much for giving us this time to share. Of course, you know I am speaking from the Division of Student Services and Development, where we support our students uh, in non-academic ways. Thank you so much and good luck to all. Thank you very much, Chrissy. That's very informative. And let me now direct to our colleague, Sarah. Sarah, are you with us? You may be able to shed some light a little more on the PG side of things. Sure, Dr. Bahadur Singh. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to everyone who's on, on who's logged on. Um, yes, thank you. And I'd like to just share what um, our Graduate Studies Office has to offer our students at this present point in time. And let me first start by referring to our postgraduate research scholarships. We specifically have the UWI postgraduate scholarships for MPhil and PhD students in particular. 
These scholarships are for full research for full-time students, and it's $60,000 per year. And, and it's running across not all of engineering, not just civil engineering or chemical, or chemical engineering, but across all the departments, yes? Uh, separate from that, um, I wanted to refer to our taught uh, scholarships for the taught degrees within engineering and um, wanted to specify within the Department of Chemical Engineering, we had the National Gas Bursary, we have the Ministry of Energy and Energy, Energy Industries Bursary. Then for civil engineering, we had a special one called the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, CCRIF scholarship. This is a regional scholarship. And I'm happy to indicate this is specifically for, for taught students in civil engineering. Uh, electrical engineering, on the other hand, we have the Delarue scholarship. And I want to tell you that two years ago, this was awarded to an MPhil in electrical and computer engineering student. So I don't want to just say it's just for taught students, but it's also for research students. So it's across the board as well. With regard to mechanical engineering, I want to refer you to the National Gas Bursary. This one, because Dr. Bridge was speaking about the um, how mechanical engineering informs energy and, and the entire motion, uh, I just want to encourage students from mechanical engineering to look at that particular bursary as well. Uh, with regard to geomatics, we have the research scholarships. And specifically with regard to Delarue, uh, with and Dr. Ellis's presentation, I wanted to refer to the um, that MSc project management degree. Uh, it's being specifically mentioned on the advertisement for that Delarue scholarship. So I want to encourage students to, to really look at those things on our website. And I'm going to put my contact information in the chat box. So if there are any questions, please send me an email and I'll be able to address all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very informative and very useful information. Thank you once again. Now I'm going to take this Q&A session a bit more to the faculty and let me invite our Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, Dr. Dr. Cherise Griffith-Charles to come online. So I have a question for you. Cherise, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Lovely. Yeah, you loud and clear. So I've seen a lot of chatter about the pre-engineering. So the first question, I have two questions for you. The first one is, is chemistry necessary for pre-engineering? Uh, because we are going to be accepting persons with CSEC qualifications from this year in the pre-eng program. We've had the pre-eng program for quite a while, but this is the first year that we're accepting people with CSEC qualifications. We want them to be good students who have passes in at least five uh, CSEC subjects. Those would be maths, ad maths, English, physics, and chemistry. So we want those specific qualifications. Excellent, thank you. And I have another question for you. There's a lot of chatter about these additional qualifications. So it's very useful to share some, share some insight into this. So the question that I'm gonna share with you is, can I apply with the N1 science qualification or only the pre-engineering programs because I did physics and chemistry, but not add math. Okay, if you have um, mathematics and physics at N1, you can apply to go directly into the BSc programs. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, Sharice, I appreciate that. So we have uh, Dr. Griffith Charles, I'll come back to you. Let me make a rounds to my other colleagues. I see a flurry of questions. Let me now invite the head of the department, Dr. Modin. Dr. Modin, are you with us? Yes, yes, I'm right here. Great, thank you. So there's been some chatter in there and I wanted to bring you on board here. So I have two questions for you. The first one is, what is the average time it takes for a UE graduate in the BSc Electrical and Computer Engineering program to get their first job? Okay, um, pre-COVID, um, the pre-shutdown period, um, the majority of our graduates will be employed within the first year. Um, the very good graduates sometimes even get employment offers as soon as they graduate. So we've had cases with first first class graduate um, students. They, they finish their exam and, are, and within the next few weeks, they're actually working somewhere, right? But on, on average, within the first year, most, um, most of the students are, are employed. And I would have, um, at that point in time, just before we shut down, it will, might have been even closer to like maybe the first six months as well. So there was a good, um, there, were, there were good employment opportunities for good electrical and computer engineering graduates. Great, so I have another question for you, Dr. Moudin. 
I am in the N1 program and would like to pursue my career in robotics. I would like to know which branch would be suitable for me at the undergraduate level. Okay, well, I'll, I'll pitch for electrical and computer engineering here. Um, a lot of robotics, um, we do have courses in robotics, um, embedded design programming that, that are relevant to, 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 to robotic work. Um, of course, mechanical engineering also you can do things like mechatronics as well. But the core of the the, the core of, of robotic design, which would be in the um, the control systems and the programming and the embedded systems and the and the computer systems and so on, can be done with us. Great, that's not a problem. Excellent. So and let me just get one more one more to you before I go to my colleagues in civil engineering. There's a question here: Is there a mm -hmm. possibility that an electrical engineer can obtain employment in the aviation field? Absolutely. Um, again, um, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, Caribbean Airlines employed 10 of our graduates. Um, there were people who specialized in, 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 um, in software, um, in computer programming, and in some cases, even in, in, in control systems as well. So um, it depends on what you're interested in. If you want to, to do avionics, then you'll have to do um, some, some other additional courses elsewhere. But the core material here is absolutely applicable to our to, to field, to our career in the um, aviation industry. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Modine. Let me now shift to civil engineering. So we have Dr. Townsend with us. Dr. Townsend, I have a question. I have a few questions for you. Two questions. We'll start with the first one. And the first one is: Can you do a BSc in civil engineering with six CSEC and the N1 program? Are you asking in terms of the? Um, entry requirements. Yes. Yes. Um, well, we, we do have an entry committee. And in fact, Dr. Kailas Banerjee, who is with us tonight, is on that entry committee. So I'm going to invite Kailas to, to join us now and just to, to share that detail in terms of six, six CSEC. Yes. They're and, talking about CSEC and the N1 program. And the N1 program, yes. So perhaps Dr. Banerjee could give some more detail in terms of what. And it would depend on what this was, those CSEC passes are in. Are they ADMATS, um, that would be your question, are they physics, etc. So Dr. Banerjee, will you be able to enlighten us a bit? Uh, hi, Arul uh, Singh, thank you. Uh, yes, I can, but as the head of civil engineering indicated, I wanted to know the particular subjects uh, of, of the qualification that the applicant is uh, looking for, and also uh, what is the N1 um, um, degree he has, he or she has. So while that information is not immediately available, perhaps you can direct uh, these particular candidates to the the um, the, the website, or website. perhaps you can share with them what are the pre-requirements. Uh, So what we can do then, um, Dr. Banerjee, let me just go straight back to your head. I think um, I have a, a good opportunity here to engage your head in this, this particular question. What is the employment rate after completion of the BSc in civil engineering? I heard it's a very saturated field. What, what are your thoughts there, Dr. Townsend? Well, I, I did show you the, the small graphic in my presentation that showed um, from the survey we did in terms of our, of our graduates, um, a large percentage of them, I think over 75% of them, um, had got employment um, certainly within the first year of their graduation. Um, these are different times. These are, as we say, COVID times. And um, a lot of the economic activity has slowed down. Um, we still have construction going on. We still have some of our graduates getting employment um, across the region and in Trinidad in, in, in the, um, either in government construction or contractors, not so much into design now because a lot of the design work has slowed down um, temporarily. But a lot of our graduates, because of the skill set that they learn in engineering, they are working um, with contractors, they're working with um, state organizations, with regional corporations, they're working with Pure, they're working with Highways Division, they're working with HDC and, and um, NIPDEC and, and UDCOT, so that Overall, the, the employment um, potential for civil engineering graduates has been strong and continues to be strong, notwithstanding that we have this particular COVID situation now 
Um, I've been in touch with a lot of our graduates over the last um, couple of months. And the, the, many of them are working, I have even one who's working in the Ministry of Planning. Why? Because the Ministry of Planning is doing some looking at some civil projects and they are, have a sort of oversight. And he as a civil engineer has been able to fit in there with his training. So that I would say overall employment prospects are good. Great, that's very useful to note. So before I go to my colleague in geomatics, running on that same trend of thought, do civil engineering companies accept undergrad students as interns? So what are the internship possibilities? Well, you know, we have, as you know, the faculty has had a very um, growing internship program and that has become very popular with the students. Um, we've had dozens of students taking advantage of that internship program. Again, with COVID, we have had to, to basically um, curtail that because of the, the necessity for us not to, not to assemble. Um, we anticipate, though, that as we move out of the COVID situation, we will be going back into our robust internship program. It's a very useful program. We go into the internship at the end of the second year. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a designed program. It's just not haphazard. It becomes part of their credits towards their degree. And um, there's a program that is designed to ensure that they benefit in terms of their learning working hand in hand and, and next to seasoned engineers in, in a real practical sense. So yes, for sure we have that internship program going. A number of firms and public sector organizations have signed on to it, have committed to it, and um, it's part and parcel of what we do. Excellent. That's very comforting to know, Dr. Townsend. Thank you very much. And let me jump now to my colleagues in geomatics, Dr. Sutherland. I have, I have three questions for you, and I think you may enjoy this. So the first one is, how would the more practical programs take place if classes are primarily online? Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for that question. Uh, right, so I, I want to use the opportunity to underscore that most of our courses are delivered online. Uh, even some of our labs have been uh, re-engineered so that uh, people uh, who are outside of Trinidad or who cannot come to the campus will be able to uh, to participate in those labs remotely. But there are, you would appreciate that uh, the surveying aspect of our discipline is a very practical uh, component. And uh, we wish to have our students be able to touch the instruments and to actually do, to do this. So online is not practical. So how do we get around this? In, uh, if you are outside of Trinidad, we tend to uh, work with surveyors in, in in those countries in order to assist with people there under COVID-19 um, restrictions of uh, social distancing. So we, 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 can, we can work with those persons outside of Trinidad through surveyors uh, in their countries in order to have them uh, participate in uh, exercises in that way, uh, as long as they are able to conform to social, social distancing. And, and other uh, requirements. And the same thing within Trinidad, what we do is we obtain permission to bring small groups uh, on campus. So we don't bring the whole class, we bring small groups and they are spread out and, and they have to maintain um, the OSH uh, criteria uh, for, for safety, which is to wash your hands and wear your mask and be uh, socially distant. And in that way, we're able to, to offer some practical uh, components um, where it is unavoidable uh, to, to, to deal with that. Excellent, very useful information. So let me throw this other one at you here, which is one of the out of world questions. You know, your presentation, <laughs> a lot of out of world dynamics. Would geomatics help to further your career in aerospace? Okay, so so um, I actually I actually had, uh, attempted to um, answer that question in the chat and I, and I take the pleasure in, in doing this uh, orally um, too. So, uh, the answer is yes. Now, if you say aerospace, aerospace is a broad field, uh, which you know depends on which aspect of it. So, for instance, there um, at a at a higher level, uh, um, there is a, a field of study called space geodesy, and uh, you will notice that in my presentation, I had put one of the, the Mars rovers in a, in the picture, and I wasn't trying to hide. Uh, one of the uh, graduates, a person that I met when when I studied in uh, 
at the University of New Brunswick in Canada, I met uh, a doctor who is now Professor uh, uh, Komiati. Uh, and he worked, after he graduated from geomatics engineering in, in Canada, he worked with NASA uh, and he worked on with NASA in order to, to deal with positions. So you have to understand that getting into space means that we are on an object that is rotating on its axis. And we have to send an object off, off that to another object that is also um, orbiting the sun and rotating on its axis. That is geomatics. But uh, so, it, it, so, and that, that means you work with aerospace. Um, he was working with the Jet Propulsion Lab, he still is. Uh, and so that, that pathway in order to deal with the positioning aspect of it, the answer is yes. But you, well, you, you wouldn't get that, you wouldn't get to that point as soon as you graduated an undergraduate degree, you would have to understand that. But as a pathway, the answer is yes, you can get there, um, depending on what you want to do with aerospace. Let me add to that too, Dr. Sutherland, from an electrical and computer perspective, there's enough math and control systems to get you into aircraft design, the avionics, the communication, the controls of the rover as well. So they go hand in hand. That's and right. It'd be very useful for audience to have an appreciation of the, the technical merits associated with consolidation of each of the disciplines. That's so right. before I go to chemical engineering, I have one more question for you. After okay. completing CAPE with environmental science, geography, history, and communication studies, also Caribbean studies, what am I qualified for? Well, immediately, immediately, because I didn't hear mathematics in there. And uh, there's no need to, I want to be very, uh, want to be very open about this, is uh, our land, I, I know for us in our, in our department, our, our BSc in land management uh, program, that person would be qualified, depending, of course, on the, on the scores. But uh, with, with those passes, immediately that person could get into uh, BSc in, in uh, land management. Now, uh, I want to say something here that because it, sometimes when you, apart from the gate situation of switching, because there are some restrictions on that, but there used to be people who would get into like a land management program and do really, really well, and then jump into another program if that is not the one that they really, really want. So, so there are many pathways to get into that. But with those passes, with those subjects, uh, one could very, very easily get into the BSc in land management, um, program, our department anyway. Lovely. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutherland. You're most welcome. Thank Let me you. continue with the other colleagues now, and uh, we'll go straight to chemical engineering. Uh, Professor Hussein, are you with us? I have here a few questions, and let me start with the first one. What is the expectation for the future of chemical engineering in Trinidad? So that's an, that's an excellent question. We do have a large petrochemical industry involve processing of gas or methanol and ammonia generation. It is a fact that our gas production has declined. But we also have to look at the future in that we can also have gas being available from reservoirs in Venezuela. We also have the LNG plant. And therefore, I think we have very good future prospects. We are also having companies that are doing deep water exploration. And I think that uh, chemical engineering is a very good future prospect. Not only in the um, petrochemical sectors, but in other areas. And I can also ask Dr. Chakabati if he would like to elaborate further. Uh, good evening, everybody, and aspiring engineers, right? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, chemical engineers can go to any field, basically, because nowadays chemical engineering has been expanded to biofield as well as deep mathematical field, too. So other than this methanol, ammonia, and what we are seeing here in our point leases, other than that, also in uh, in, in, in turbine industry, also chemical engineers are working because people who love programming, they are doing some, just now you are discussing about aerospace, right? So that kind of programming, wind tunnel and wind direction, wind movement, everything is being done by chemical engineers. Other than that, now food science and technology, right? 
with a graduate degree with some specialization in food also, they are now looking at preservation, like for a cold storage, how to use the air, the wind with baffles and how to make the higher residence time. So there are also a lot of chemical engineers are working. So in, in, in and as well as the economic aspect of chemical engineering is also there. So in finance field also chemical engineers are working very hard. So chemical engineers are now open to everything. Of course, not in electrical. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they can go to anything. Excellent. So let me um, ask you another question here, Professor Hussein. There's another question that comes in here. Does chemical and process engineering fall into the category of manufacture of chemicals? And the example here is household products. Can you share some insight here? Yes, certainly it does. And um, Dr. Chakabati, would you want to um, an answer? Uh, for food, means, uh, can you repeat the question again? Uh, so the question is for the manufacture of chemicals. Does chemical and process engineering fall into that category? Yeah, they will fall, but basically for scale up things. Scale up things means when it is uh, manufacturing a chemical, it is just a recipe of chemist, right? But when you put it in a continuous plant, you need to have a continuous reactor, distillation tower and everything. The pumps, compressors, it's coolants and uh, cooling chambers. Air coolers, everything is there. So th those process fields are generally controlled by chemical engineers. So we need them. them. Great. So and last question to you, Prof. Hussein, before we go to the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering is, can you be accepted with a diploma in chemical engineering? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, generally, the requirement is in first degree. So, I'm sorry, the BSc? No, a diploma. Oh, the diploma in to do the masters? Okay. I'm assuming here this will be the undergraduate. It has not, it did not specify, but I would assume oh, okay. the undergraduate. Can you be yes, accepted? We, yes, yes, we will have to look at the courses that were done in the, um, in the diploma program, and then we can make an assessment. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Professor. Can Zeno. I add something uh, sure. here? Yeah, in this diploma, basically, actually, what we are looking for, if it is from chemical, right, the diploma in chemical, we generally look for some higher GPA. That's it. Yeah. And that can be, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So let me move now to the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, Dr. Bridge. So I have a question here that I think you would be um, very, very excited to answer. It's about renewable energy. And it says... I would like to specialize in renewable energy engineering. Can I do a BSc in mechanical engineering? And what will that qualify me to further my studies in? Renewable energy engineering? Question. Okay. Yes. So if your interest is in renewable en energy, then mechanical is a pathway to get into to that. Um, so we do energy engineering on a whole. So it, we would look at um, the different forms of renewable energy um, and also how to uh, minimize your energy use so that you get the optimal use of the renewable energy resource. So yes, it is a way to get into renewable energy. I think it could also, you could also be interested in renewable energy from an electrical engineering standpoint as well, um, from a chemical engineering, bio, biogas, biomass, but primarily, um, Mechanical is a good way to get there. Yeah. Excellent. And another question here. Uh, this one I've shared with Dr. Sutherland as well. I think you may, may have a, a good perspective on it. How would the more practical programs take place if primarily online? I think this might be very useful for you. Right. Um, so for our students, our first year students have to do a, pract a very practical course um, in workshop technology. And so as was done in the Department of uh, Geomatics and Land Management. We, what we did was we had our students come in in batches. So they came in as a group so that we wouldn't have too much contamination. <laughs> we have here, like a little bubble of students and um, they went through the, all the COVID protocols and uh, they continuously did a set of labs 
uh, of ex, um, practical ex things over yeah. and a half. Yeah. Lovely. And before I, I go back to the Deputy Dean on the Graduate Affairs, let me ask you this final question here. Does the BSc program in mechanical engineering have a part-time option? At the moment, no. It is something that we're exploring, but it is not. we do not have that option as a formal option yet. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Bridge. And I now move to go back. I've just made one round. Let me go back to the Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Affairs, Dr. Griffith Charles. Dr. Griffith Charles. So we, we had okay. some conversations earlier with the pre-engineering. I just want to bring this back a little bit. There's been a lot of discourse in the chat about the other qualifications. So let me invite you to comment on these particular questions. The first question is, since I have to write CSEC chemistry in June and results are most likely to come out late September, will I be considered? Um, well, this year we are going to be accepting persons if you have very good qualifications. Otherwise, um, if they don't have the CSEC chemistry, but we will ask them to do a, an, equi a, an equivalent course in chemistry while they are doing their level one in the BSc. And they have to, to have passed that course prior to going on to level two. Okay. Excellent. So it would be like a co-requisite course. Okay, lovely. But they have to have done, have very good grades already. Okay. And then there's another question that speaks to the associate degree. Would an associate degree in the required subject substitute for CAPE qualifications or is CAPE mandatory to apply? Um, this is for the BSCs. In the BSCs, associate yes. degrees are um, considered if you have a GPA that is acceptable to the particular program, sometimes a three GPA or 3.5 GPA um will uh, will be acceptable to a particular program we also take technicians diplomas as well and these are good qualifications when once you meet the gpa requirements excellent excellent and there's one other comment here before i move to Ms. simone roberts so last question for you deputy dean undergraduate affairs is technical drawing at CSEC preferred over electronic CSEC for pre-engineering in addition to the subject stated? Well, I mean, we have uh, required courses. So if you have additional courses, um, that would be fine. We don't anticipate that you have to, to meet those other requirements, but um, technical drawing would be fine if you have it. You will be doing some technical drawing in the pre-engineering program anyway excellent okay thank you very much dr griffith charles and let me now move to Ms. simone roberts simone i have a question for you and this question is can you be accepted based on your unit one qualifications in keep if you are also registered to write unit two good evening chair good evening to all the participants and the answer to that is yes like last year, the university has relaxed the matriculation requirements for admission. So applicants will be considered with results from unit one or unit two and with registration for the other units. So one unit of CAPE is considered. Excellent. Thank you very much. I want to have one more for you before I go to civil engineering. Sure. And the, question, the question is very simple. If I am in law six, when should I apply? If you're in law six now and you're doing exams coming up this year, June or July, then you would apply in November in the next application round, November 2021. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simone. Appreciate that. Thank you. Let me now shift back to civil engineering. Dr. Townsend, are you there? Dr. Sorry. Townsend, I have a question for you. And after that question, I'm going to go to electrical. So question to you is, what are the pre-requirements for a postgrad MSc in reservoir engineering? I am an undergraduate student at the UWI. However, I am a non-engineering student. Reservoir engineering. Um, if this person is talking about um, oil reservoirs, then you know that is a, a different matter in terms of the 
engineering in terms of water resources reservoirs. So if you're talking about the whole question of designing um, water reservoirs, then the, we're talking about wanting to do the master's program in civil engineering, all right? And the prerequisite is that you need to have a, a good bachelor's degree. In, and of course, a good bachelor's degree could be one that came from UE or from an equivalent um, qualification from another university. Um, we we like you to also have uh, uh, one year of, of experience before you come into the master's program as well. But those things are always going to be assessed on your application. And depending on the nature of what your pre-qualification and experience is, then you would make a judgment. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And let me now move quickly to electrical and computer engineering. Dr. Mudina, I have a quick question for you. Are the MASC and the MSC equivalent? Um, yes, uh, what happens is that in our particular case, when we were designing our postgraduate um, qualification, just to emphasize the fact that engineering is applied science, our program was called um, a master's of applied science in, elect uh, well, in, in electrical and computer engineering, but it is a master of science, it's the same thing. And last question for the evening, uh, Dr. Mudin, before we move over to the Dean. And this one concerns some matriculation. It says, mm -hmm. here, if someone has to write the unit two exams, but has a grade three in pure math and grade one in physics and IT, can they still be eligible to be accepted into electrical and computer engineering? We will look at the, um, the there's a point system where we look at, at, at all of your grades and, and um, without knowing any more, um, any more specifics of that particular case, I would say yes. Right, it has happened before, and, and it, um, well, once we get a full record, there may um, there isn't any reason to, to say no at this point in time. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Modine. So, folks, we are nearing the end of the program. And before I ask the Dean to bring his closing remarks, let me remind you all that the deadline for applications are very soon, and that is the 31st of July. So please do your very best to register, uh, register at sta.uwi.edu forward slash apply. And today's session, we have focused specifically on the Faculty of Engineering. And let me turn you over to the Dean and then I will wrap things up. So over to you, Dean Ekwe. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Chair Dr. Anderson. And thanks a lot uh, to all our health departments uh, thanks to Dr. Ellis for the excellent uh, presentations from all our heads and Dr. Ellis, as I said. And thanks a lot to all our deputy deans who have also assisted us. And thanks to all our colleagues from the bursary, from the graduate school, from admissions, from student services. And thanks a lot to all you prospective students who have joined us. Thanks again to the marketing and communications for the nice work they have done. Uh, you must have heard from all our presenters that all our programs are internationally accredited. So if you come into our program, you're going to enjoy it. And the engineering, you must have heard, you know, we, have, we are concerned with many aspects, but there is uh, nothing you can do without engineering. Whether it is your bridges, your dams, your airplane, the 3D printing, the smartphones, uh, geometrics, all aspects. What can we do without engineering? Okay. In the campus here, we are engaged in fisheries, immobility, fresh shields, respirators, ventilators, masks. Okay. So without engineering, life will be very difficult. And then there are different aspects we have heard. So engineering is very broad. We have heard of sport engineering internships. We have heard of chemical wells, food and beverages, nanotechnology, structural analysis, geology, hydrology, air pollution, computer, uh, drawings, power generation, communication systems. What can we do without engineering? Machine learning, heavy industry, and all the other aspects. Computer engineering controls, design, automation, engineering management, alternative energy, uh, all the various aspects. Hydrology, remote sensing, geodesy, estate management. So engineering is very, very broad. We also have quantity surveying, postal management, land management, project management, robotics. Engineering is very, very broad. 
It's a broad choice. So whatever you are interested in, you are going to get the, you are going to get that in engineering. So we we'll really urge you to uh, apply, and we we'll thank you again for your participation at this great event. Thanks a lot again, and I hand back to the chair. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dean Ekwe. Thank you very much. And colleagues, members of the audience, this brings us to the end of this evening's proceedings. And it has been a pleasure to host this session. Today's session focus on the Faculty of Engineering. If you'd like to learn more about the programs that are available at any of the other faculties, be sure to register for the faculty information sessions, which will be hosted in the upcoming weeks. You can register by visiting sta.uwi.edu forward slash virtual open day. The chat moderator will share with you a link where you can access the full schedule and registration information. From all of us here, we look forward to welcoming you to the UWI family. And please don't forget, hashtag choose action. Wish you all a very pleasant good night.